Hello, Travis. How are you? Doing great. Hey, Jeremy. Good to see you. Good to see you too. I'm really honored to have you on the, this first episode of the Dream Podcast um, for Data Rules Everything Around Me. It's um, super, super great to be able to talk to one of the, I would say, one of the most popular data scientists in the world, where you're a few uh, that has been very impacting the whole uh, community. But yeah, you're one of the most renowned data scientists. This is a fact. And, um, and you've been creating a lot of very interesting libraries like NumPy, like SciPy. You've been the founder of Anaconda. You've been working all your life for open source. Um, and, and building this Python ecosystem that is so rich right now and has, and has been really a game changer for me. Like literally, as you know, I'm coming from Excel. I went from Excel to Python and then a whole new world opened to my, to my eyes. <laughs> so um, I'm very, very happy to have you. And um, as, as this is the first episode, uh, episode of the podcast, I just want to, to put the rules of this podcast on, which is only three questions. So it's about what's your story, what drives you, and uh, what's your vision of the future. So this is only the three things that we need to use as material for expanding our thoughts and our questions and our discussions. So it's really a free flow that I want to do with all those inspiring people like yourself that I will be able to, to meet, and I hope there will be many. So, like, without any further, like, uh, discussion or expectation or anything else, um, let's, let's deep dive right in. And um, can you basically tell us your story? Where do you come from? Who are you, Travis? And um, what's, what's the history of, the, of this guy? Uh, wow, Jeremy, that's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure. It's an honor to be here. Uh, congratulations on the new podcast. I look forward to seeing the other guests and you know, hearing about what happens here. Um, I can talk about a little bit where I come from. Many people know the story, but I'm in about kind of what, what drives me. It leads to what drives me. Um, I am a, a scientist, an electrical engineer initially, and I became a medical imaging student at the Mayo Clinic and was very interested in information from data. So I started in electromagnetic radiation, uh, electromagnetic um, earth re uh, remote sensing. We had satellite scatterometry. We'd measure wind speed. We, we could infer wind speed by looking at this backscatter, but also could look mm -hmm. at ice coverage and look at kind of earth remote sensing. That was my start as a master's degree student at Brigham Young University. And then I went to Mayo Clinic to study uh, kind of how to use that kind of information processing to discern medical images and improve medical uh, observation. That okay. was what led me to Python, was that, that deep desire to deal with data and get information out of data. So I've been sort of pursuing that for 30 years. Uh, how do we get more information out of data? Loved applied math. My, my, my real love is applied math. I took a course on numerical methods that really inspired me. That was like, oh, you could use computers to do math. This is really cool. And, and I've been inspired ever since by that, by that process of using computers to do math, and particularly yeah. math that helps information processing. So that's, that's my I origins. See. That's why I got in this space. I was a student. I was on an academic track, a PhD student, and doing what a lot of PhD students do, which is you're kind of wandering around trying to figure out how to be relevant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What should, what should I do? <laughs> It's, yeah, it's kind of like the walkabout. I mean, some, some organization, you go out to the, you go walk in the woods and find yourself. In many ways, PhDs <laughs> can be a little like that. Kind of go walk amongst the stacks of library books. That, that was a time we still did. I still did make copies of papers and read them. You know, nowadays, that's probably not what people do to collect their, their volumes of information, but that's what I, I did back then. But, you know, it's yeah. feeling, it was, it was right as the internet was coming of age. But at the same time the internet was coming of age, people were sharing code. Right, so I was, I was steeped in this culture of sharing scientific knowledge and paper writing at the same time that you know, the sharing of code was becoming easier with the you know, prevalence of the internet. This is 1998, 99 timeframe. So the internet was just starting. I mean, it had been around for a while, but, but the ease of sharing code was, was improving. Now we didn't have GitHub, but you could, yeah. they, we, had, we had mailing lists, right? And so you could go and you could, and we had Google. So Google will let you search 
and you would find things like I could type in, Hey, I'm looking, I'm doing some scientific programming. I want to be able to plot better and they'd get uh, your Yorick and PDL. And I'd have these tools out there that would go, Oh, okay. Install this. It was basically, I was a MATLAB user and I was trying to look for oh. ways to do data processing at scale because MATLAB, <laughs> MATLAB didn't let me define float 32. It, 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 it could, but it was pretty awkward and it wasn't really built in. So, and I was dealing with five dimensional data sets at the time that I needed to fit in memory in order to do my vectorized calculation. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't, I, I could try to write, you know, I could spend time writing algorithms to do out of core and you could at the time, but it, writing code that way led me a field from the problem I was solving. To all of a sudden now I'm doing this computer science problem. And, and it's sort of, and it's, it's, it's a con, it's actually a common reality, right? How, you know, people want to think about what they're doing and solve the problem in their head as opposed to the new problem in their head that's there because mm -hmm. the compute infrastructure isn't helping them. Like this has been, this has been true since the dawn of computation. It's, it's still an issue, right? Because it, 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 we're humans and we can only yeah. think of a few things at a time, it turns out, right? We're pretty yes. good, but we can only think of a few things at a time. And so like, you know, there's old adage, a lot of things get built because the people are lazy or whatnot. It's less about laziness and more about just not wanting to have to think about these things and keeping your head. I think it's anyway, about ability to concentrate. Yeah. It's ability yeah. to concentrate yeah. on one thing. Yeah. Like it, the more you focus on one thing, the better you perform at it basically. So I think it's also yes. a question of, yes. Yes. hundred percent. So that's hmm. the situation I was in, but I was trying to get my PhD in medical imaging, doing some calculations on large amounts of, of, of data. Um, MRI and ultrasound data primarily, but it was five dimensional. I was taking, I was finding numerical derivatives to those data and then solving a, a, a wave equation basically. So I was looking around for a better way to do that than just in MATLAB. And especially there were two things. One was the lack of floats. The other thing was I was starting to be open source aware. I, I was using Linux. I liked the freedom that it gave me. Um, I, you know, not that I'd be, I wasn't like opposed to buying software, but I was, uh, I wasn't liking the limitations that that sometimes afforded. I, I would use MATLAB and then I had a big licensing problem because I used MATLAB and then I used this other set of libraries doing optimized um, optimization and the two used the same licensing server and they wouldn't work together and I couldn't get the two companies to talk to each other. Like I'd already had that experience. And so I was kind of, when I, I said, I need to find an open source library to do this with. Because you know Linux was becoming popular. I was thinking, I need, we need, I need to use open source to do this. How old was Linux? Linux? Linux was, I, I started, I don't know, good question. I started using Linux about 95, you know, so I think mm. a few years, a few years, I think Linux came out in the early 90s. Uh, but it was early on, like Red Hat was established. And I remember I was a Red Hat user for a while and then I became other, but Linux, Linux and Google were actually two big things that led me to be able to use Python. So, and you know, yeah. because I could search for things, I could use Linux. I couldn't have used Linux without Google because there's the, error, the the common thing to do is type in your error message and then get the help. It would lead to <laughs> somebody who could help you debug what was going on because yeah, yes, you could read the code, but, but actually reading all the code to figure out what was going on was going to be a long, a long journey every single time. So, but then when That's I said that, that experience taught me to appreciate open source and appreciate the, the fact that, Oh, there's a community of experts out there that I can lean on. And also having been a scientist and publishing papers, I knew there was those communities out there and I would, I would have conversations at conferences with them. But then when I, I started to just find, like, let me find a tool. So I used Yorick and, and Gist and, and then I found Python. You know, Python was released in 1991 for the first time, it started in 89, first version, but the really first 1.0 didn't come out till 94. And then 95, a, 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 a set of people in, in, I think it was March of 95, they started to work because on it, the math library. And that was Guido three years before I started two years. was doing it for, I, I, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that Guido, the, found, the founder of Python, made a few iterations before reaching this Python. Uh, he, it was yeah, called he, another he thing also. In the 80s. Yeah, I, you could, and I don't remember the story precisely. You can look, I mean, it's, you can look it up. It was a different mm -hmm. language. He was basically, he was looking to make a teach, a language that was easier to teach, effectively a better bash. Like, you know, a lot of people are using bash, a scripting language, you know, script. So he was looking to build a scripting language that's easier to teach and easier to learn, easier to use. And, you know, being a, a computer science and a, and a language author was very interested in syntax, very interested in, you know, the parser and then kind of 
the kind of code. He was not himself like aware of the scientific use case, like personally. Like every he's uh, been very very open and welcoming. He's been very open and welcoming to that community since the nineties. Like before I got there, I, I joined the community in ninety eight roughly 97, 98. I started using it in 97. And then I had the experience of a year later in 98, I came back to the code I wrote in 97. And I liked, I could understand it. So it was like, oh, it's, I can, I can understand what I wrote. This is something I had to communicate <laughs> at. Because you'd write, as a scientist, you'd write some code quickly. And then coming back to it later, I went, oh, I get this still. This is still makes sense. I hadn't, I did not have that experience with Perl in 94 to 96. In 93, 92 to 96, I did not have experience. Perl, I wrote once and read never, right? So, um, I mean, Perl has a lot of capabilities. And I, I have a lot of respect for the language and a lot of respect for the what it what it helped allow. It was the P, original P in the LAMP stack, right? There was a lot of capability there. But Python had this, oh, my goodness, this is something meaningful. I can, yeah. I don't have to spend my life to become an expert in computers to be able to use Python effectively as a scientist, as someone looking to, I can, data. I can relate to that even as a business user. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That was, that was a, aha. Uh -huh. that was kind of an aha moment and it turned mm -hmm. out that, you know, 10 to 12 other people were having that aha moment at the same time. Like there was, you know, a, a group of people were having that aha moment and there was a matrix SIG. It was a mailing list back in the day. That's how we gathered is we just post emails to a mailing list. We collect them. There was this Python program called Mailman that would that ended up running most of these mail lists, and you would basically have this communication. It's kind of like a modern Discord or Discuss channel, but it was very very common. These mailing lists, and they still exist, but they're not as commonly used anymore. Uh, the Python mailing list still exists. Uh, the NumPy mailing list still exists. Anyway, we would we would post on these lists, and it was it was amazing. It would, I really really loved the conversations that would ensue. You'd get you you like, very intelligent and caring and in like, very detailed, you know, and specific questions as well as answers get answered. And so participating in that became this really, really lovely um, part of my PhD experience was, and so in 98 to 99, I particular, I, I had some needs myself. I needed to write some, I, I started to use Python. I said, I'm going to use Python for my PhD. So great. I'm going to start, that became the language I would use. And then I had known enough, I'd written C before. And Python is built with C. So if you look at Python, yeah. it's actually implemented in C. And so I could read the code. And so I started to get a feel for, oh, this is actually what's happening when I'm writing Python and how that relates to what I understood about how C worked. And so I could build programs. And I really, really started to, as I needed things, I said, oh, I need to read, I need to read data. I need to, I want to do integration. I want to do optimization. It became a very straightforward thing for me every time I needed something. And I'm a PhD student, so I'm not, you know, my time is worth more, is worth less than the money I'm earning. So I can do it for, I go, ah, rather than pay for this, I'll just go do it. And I, I could, I, would, I did for basically a year, year and a half, uh, all through 99. I, I basically delayed my PhD by about a year in order to go and wrap code. Uh, potentially there's Fortran code out there. There's C libraries out there. And I would pull them in and create Python extension using the C API and release that to the world initially as a tarball, initially as a, as a, as a source code. So I just go, here's the source code for this new library that does optimization using Fortran's Netlib uh, library for optimization. So quad pack, ODE pack. So several of these I started to release in 99, you can see it like almost like every three months I'd put out another package that was for that you would, you could use for science and Python. And, mm. and then I collected them into something called multi-pack and in 1990, you know, end of 1999, I put out multi-pack and a, a high school, so it was a tarball. You could download it and install it yourself. There's instructions for how to build two things happened that were sort of really, in, really impactful. One is a gentleman in Estonia, uh, I'd never met before and I didn't know where Estonia was, uh, but it was, you know, recently, uh, emerged from the Soviet union at the time. It mm -hmm. basically, he, he wrote, he wrote a make file. So I, I, I had a make file that worked kind of, but he said, Oh, here's a better one. And he, he wrote a complete make file for it. The other thing he started to do was go, Hey, why are you wrapping these Fortran libraries one by one? Let me actually help. I'm going to go build a, something called F to pi. I'm going to build an automatic wrapper that'll, that'll parse the Fortran and automatically generate the C, the extension to Python for that Fortran code. So I, I was, 
amazed, frankly, that, that he would, <laughs> that, that seemed like a really hard problem to me, but he dove at it, wrote a parser, wrote the, exen the, the extension. And because I had written a bunch of extensions, we could kind of, okay, this is the target we're hitting. This is what we're trying to get to. And I could help him debug a few things. Like there was a couple of really nasty problems, like re-entrance. You know, if you call an optimization routine and the Python hands over to the C, to the, to the compiled code, then the compiled code may, you have a Python function. So the compiled code then calls Python again. So then mm -hmm. what happens when the Python code itself calls the optimization routine? We had this in integration in particular, like a, like a double integral is effectively integrals calling integrals. And so we called that re the, it's the reentrance problem, right? And like mm -hmm. I, you have to do things to make that work, right? And it's similar to how you have to work concurrency. So I had made it work correctly and in, in like manually, and we kind of made it work with his automatic generated code. This is stuff that was happening in '99. So, so but but Piero Peterson he did that. Then the second thing that happened was a guy named Robert Kern who was a high school student at the time, did not know he was a high school student at the time. He just showed up and said, hey, I've got these binaries available for this multi-pack project that this guy has written. I call it multi-pack, right? I was very good at naming, <laughs> not, <laughs> just very generic. Uh, and, and he basically built, he compiled it so that Windows users could install it with a simple click, right? And then of course, the number of users went up by a factor of 100 when people yeah. can get this stuff installed. And, mm. and that was a very, uh, you know, very, very, that whole journey that, so over the course of a year, year and a half, by that time I'd started to just talk to a bunch of people, a lot of conversations were happening on the main list about what we could, you know, we should ought to do something here. This could become bigger. And then, you know, that's, that's how I, a, a friend contacted me and said, hey, I want to make something, let's pull this together and I want to, I want to build a community and we'll call it SciPy. And so the mm. SciPy project the SciPy project emerged in 2000 and was released in 2001 is essentially multi-pack plus, plus um, a few other modules from people that had their, their pieces. Piaru and Eric Jones is the other person's name. He, had, he went on to found Quants, uh, sorry, he went on to found Nthought. And I, uh, that was the first company I worked at when I left academia. But anyway, that's the, that's the origin story of where it came from. Now, a lot of people- That's your know, foundation that's moment. That's the foundation that's the moment was basically that, that moment of but it really was this, it was, it was a, Hey, I'm releasing something to the world and there's a feedback happening, right? Mm. That's very immediate, very real. And so I, I you know, you, we do that with companies all the time. And I encourage people when they're creating something like you need to get the feedback. It's about whether this is something people want or not. Is this something that's a helpful or not? Because you have to be driven by that. If you, I mean, yes, obsessed, creating, I would say you have to be, yeah, obsessed. It's a good idea. It's a good point. Yes. And so, and that's what I was doing. Now it wasn't a company per se, but it was a movement. It was a, it was a thing. It was, and it's not that dissimilar. Like, I mean, the only thing that cutting a company adds is sustainability is okay. Let's make sure we can keep doing this. And but sure. I was, I was rooted in science. I was rooted in academia. I was rooted in, Hey, I, and that's how, I, that's how science works. I was, I was not yet aware of how science, the business of science works. I, I learned that later as I became a professor and started to apply for grants and, and so forth. But um, anyway, at the, the same time that was happening, I have to, I do have to say one thing because it part of my foundation story and some have heard this, I'll say it quickly. I, I cared about open source and I, I was very intimately, I loved this participation in a global ecosystem of people making the world a better place. We'd often say, you know, mm -hmm. the, what's your impact on the planet? What's your impact on the world's capability set? That gets, that's the important thing. Now, I also had, I, had I, I married young. I met the woman of my dreams early. She's amazing. I love her. To, I mean, her name's nice. Amy. She's amazing. We've been, we, we're actually celebrating our 30th year anniversary this year. Congratulations. So, you know, yeah, thank you. It's, it's, it's the SciPy data ecosystems 28th year anniversary this year. Cause it started in 95 and you know, <laughs> I started my, my marriage in 93. Right. So it was before this, <laughs> but we, uh, we, we, we had three kids already. I was a grad student, we had three kids. And so I'm thinking, I don't know, I gotta, you know, and, and she was sick with the first kid and we'd basically chosen, she'd chosen to, to basically primarily take care of the kids and, and uh, raise them. Yeah, and so yeah. I'm Good. like, okay, this is, this, is the, this is the agreement we've, you know, we pair, I, I will go and make money. And so I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm in grad school, I'm going, okay, I, I, this is great. I love this participation in open source, but I got three kids at home. 
who I got to make sure have shoes, right? And have places. Yeah, of so course. Food. I, I, I went, <laughs> how, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this long term? So I started, that, that was that was what prompted me to, so of course I did what any, what any academic does. You go read, you go study. And at the time you go Google search. You're like, so I did a combination of library searches and Google searches to under, to try to understand economics, right? And to teach myself economics. So that's also mm. what any good computer, you know, computer person does is become knowledgeable about something they do they go to school for <laughs> and then pretend they know what they're talking about. Uh, so <laughs> I, but that's what I did. I tried to understand economics. That journey led me on a, essentially led me to entrepreneurship that led me to the power of entrepreneurship the, and the, and then how business works and, and how, what it means to trade in a world. It led me to a couple of epiphanies. Uh, that you, you can have, a, you, I, I, I'm happy to talk with other people about, but that's, it led me, I would, that moment of open source and the need to support my family meant I was not going to be a professor doing open source forever. Yes. Like it just, I got that. Like yeah. there's, there's other reasons. I mean, you can, there's different, you know, I, I try, I mean, I was comfortable in academia, so I stayed there for a while and I stayed there, became a professor, but ultimately my mind and heart was on how do we make open source sustainable long-term and how build business around it. So that's, I think that's, you said that's, it. The, that's what you need to know. That's what you need to understand about me. And that's what drives yeah, me. That's yeah. why I started this way. Yeah. I think making open source sustainable makes so much sense when we listen to your story. Like it was okay. How I love this. How do I make it sustainable for my family to, to grow and right. for my life to keep going. Okay. That's, that's super cool. So right. that foundation moment led you to, so um, we talked about SciPy. NumPy came after or came before? Yes, uh, NumPy came after. Yeah, many people don't get that SciPy came first. I wrote NumPy to save SciPy, basically. So <laughs> really? is this Hubble, yes, the Hubble Space Telescope. So SciPy was released in 2001, the very first. And it, and it, it, it was essentially a version. It was a distribution of Python masquerading as a library. It had a lot of capability in it. Like it really could have been like six packages, but it was mm. one package because packaging was really bad, right? Like uh, making releases, what were you going to ship? Like, like I just experienced before of the single click installer was really a big deal for getting users. So, and there was no way to build, there was no distribution of Python. There was just pack <laughs> packages. So okay. this is a package. But at the same time, the, the Hubble Space Telescope, so it was a big library, and we learned quickly what, what it means to scale open source and how difficult it can be to have a single library doing everything and how do you manage that, and especially without any paid, with any, without, especially if everybody's volunteers, especially when there's no mm -hmm. like, money for product management or, or program management. So we had um, then Hubble Space Telescope was using numeric at the time. But it wasn't quite enough. They wanted new features. They wanted some out of memory capability. They wanted new data types. They wanted to be able to have record record arrays effectively. And so they had started on a project called NumArray. And the way they'd done that is they'd done something more. It was all in Python to start with, and they were optimizing pieces. Whereas Numeric was a, all written in C as an extension to the Python language. Like Python itself is written in C, and it's structured in a way that every object you create in Python is there's a C represent there's a C code that produces it and it's extensible mm -hmm. you can create your own c codes you can write your own integers you can write your own anything and then it fits into the python ecosystem just just pretty easily so numeric was that number a was this other thing but it had some benefits and some trade-offs well in about 2004 2003 2004 somebody wrote a package called nd image and nd image was a convolution package but it had in it a morphology capability so morphology, image morphology is something I'd learned about in medical, in medical imaging in my PhD. And I'd always wanted mm -hmm. to have that in SciPy. Well, he came out and wrote it. And I'm like, that's so cool. I'd love to have access to that library. But it, but it depended on NumArray. And NumArray had a different memory structure than NumPy. So you couldn't even use the same memory. Like, here's your NumPy array. Then to actually use any image, you'd have to copy the data from NumPy into NumArray and then use the library. And I looked at that and said, this is, this is terrible. This is going to be split the community and we'll have people using one library versus another. And it's still a nascent fledgling community. And so I'm sitting there as a professor at BYU, uh, my alma mater, Brigham Young University. I was a professor of electrical computer engineering there. And I had a class, draw, a class, it was doing software radio. It was basically an MRI class. We we're trying to build an MRI uh, using okay. you know, just the antenna for it and the, and, and, the, and the machinery for it. But I, it, 
it, it, it fell apart. Nobody, we didn't get it. We didn't get enough people signed up for it. So I didn't have a class to teach. And so I went, Hmm, I, I can write, I'll just use the next three months to write, to kind of write another version of, of, of a Ray library. It was daunting. I didn't felt, I didn't feel like really I was ready for that. I felt like I could write libraries and extensions, but I wasn't a computer scientist writing a really good array object. I couldn't have done on my own. Um, however, numeric existed, number existed. I thought I certainly can put the elbow grease into trying to merge these two and I can put, mm. and I can put this, you know, the effort into coordinating with people. So I, I called up, um, Paul Dubois, who was running numeric. I called up Perry Greenfield, who was running the number a, you know, talk to them about my intention and what I thought I could do. They were encouraging, but, but also, you know, you know, good luck, <laughs> you know, it was, it was yeah. encouraging, but, but not, but not, you know, knowing it was a challenge. And then I called, uh, um, I called Guido. I didn't call him. I emailed Guido and said, Hey, would you meet me in San Mateo and meet me for, for lunch? And so I met with Guido and Paul Dubois to talk about, because partly I, it wasn't just a technology problem. It was a social problem, right? It was like, here's the technology. How do I get the number of users to use it? How do I, how do I, how do I merge these two communities so that they use the same code? Right. Yes, building technology was a piece, but the other piece was how do I get adoption? Who are happy with their code? How do I get them to use this new this new one? And so I was basically meeting with Guido and Paul to strategize about that. And one of the one of the one of the ideas this is shows this shows kind of how long it took Python 3.0 to get to get get adopted because this is in 2005. You know, I basically was asking, hey, well, let's make what if we made NumPy part of Python 3.0? Like, let's just put the array library because Numeric had had some. You know, um, Guido had done specific things to make Python more accessible to scientists. Like, and, yeah. and I've talked about this in the past, but he's done very specific things like uh, complex numbers, you know, comma, you know, getting rid of parentheses to create tuples so the indexing, multi-dimensional indexing would look good. Uh, uh, it's extended slicing syntax. You could have every other. Um, there's a few things he's done. Eventually, they got the matrix multiply operator in. That was, you know, should have happened a lot sooner, but, but thanks to Nathaniel Smith to make that happen. Uh, anyway, um, he does some things, so he was open. The Guido has always the thing that's been very great about Guido is honestly, he's he's very intelligent and opinionated about things, but he's very open to conversation. He's not he doesn't just shut you down. Like some technologists, we all know them. They're essentially towers yeah. of no, right? They're mm -hmm. basically. They, they've never heard an idea they didn't they they, they liked. Everything's always a new <laughs> no. and, and there's a place for that. To be clear, I mean, there's a place for that. That helps. But you know, Guido was more willing to entertain new new ideas, especially if it would help Python be adopted by another group of people. So he respected mm -hmm. the early scientists who came to the field. People like Conrad Hinson, David Asher, Paul Dubois, and uh, Jim Huguenin, who wrote the original Numeric. And and I love to mention smart uh, uh, MIT grad. You know, these were people that existed, and I, and I mentioned them for a lot of reasons. One is because I was inspired by people to write code. And so a large part of what I try to do is say, look, if you can learn anything from me, it's, it's do. Be inspired. Do something. You can have a massive impact mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you let if, – don't let your fears get in the way of your, of your desire. And don't let um, – and then no, you have to work with people. Like learn to work with people and – and sometimes that means laying aside some of your ego, means laying aside some of what you'd like, you think is best. And there's constant conversations like that to have. I can tell you lots of stories about, you know, um, and, I and can it's imagine. hard, but it, it's hard, but it also is the only way you really get groups together to work at scale. And that's essentially what we were able to accomplish is get what was a start as a small group of people who cared about yeah. this and were willing enough to spend their free time doing something that nobody cared about. And that, you know, maybe a few occasional, a few scientists cared about to create this foundation that became this massive thing that massive. millions of people are using, right? <laughs> yes. I, I'm, I'm still blown away by it, honestly. I'm blown away by it, not because I know the power of human cooperation. Like I was convinced of it before I started. I knew it was possible. I, I did not predict the, the, the scope and scale. I didn't, it, I mean, but, but, it's, but it's I want people good. to understand what leads to this and, and that it's actually working together. And then following things, you know, basically you, you, you push hard in a direction, not knowing the future, but you push hard and work hard. And then you, you, you patiently work with other people and you, and you, um, you correct, you, you're a learner. You try to hear you, you update. Yeah. You iterate you constantly your thinking. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I relate so much it to that. It takes a lot of effort. 
Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. I mean, anyway, I, mean I, I can relate so much on this. <laughs> Number yeah, came cool. from that and came out in 2006. And then that got, that started to really get adoption. It sort of hit in a really good time. The bank started to use it. Actually, one of the big adopters early in the, in the industry were the banks after the 2008 crisis. So 2008 oh, hit. Yeah, so in some sense, you know, that, that silver lining on that crisis was that, you know, the banks all had to get better um, risk analysis systems. And a couple of key people in the banking system realized that the Python ecosystem with NumPy and then SciPy and related tools could actually help them more quickly build these risk analysis systems and then not have any you know licensing dependencies so it started to get adopted and it's in i didn't know about this stuff 2009 2010 time frame but but it started to get adopted and then and then basically that that was one industry that helped it but it got adopted lots of places um 2008 i gave i, I uh, in 2008 i gave a talk at euro SciPy and it was our and i toured around germany and it was already been adopted at ti and and uh, a couple of car manufacturers, BMW, like like Python was starting to creep in from from the scientist angle. Wherever there was a scientist working, they'd heard of Python, they'd had this sort of story because SciPy had been around since two thousand one. You know, yeah. And uh, but it always it always takes longer than you think to get to get critical mass. I think it's very important this this thing yeah to to understand that even if you don't know the future, you just know one thing it, that it will take time. And you need to yes. give yourself give give yourself of time, yeah. Yes. And so tell me, Travis, about um, so I'm I'm curious because basically what you, what you framed from the beginning of this conversation was the need for abstraction to to write code and to wrap things together, and I think there is this idea of a group of people, a small group of people, having greater impact, even greater than they what they imagined, like. And I, I remember yes. this talk from Peter Wang, you're one of the co-founder of Anaconda uh, in Lex Friedman podcast, where he was saying like, we were literally like a bunch of people you could fit in a bus that could, li <laughs> like, that, that could have potentially done so much. And, and I, I would like to, to use this reference to probably move to Anaconda and how you, you sure. scaled something out of, out of this foundation story. Yeah, no, 100%. So I, I mentioned I, I learned about entrepreneurship and, and the need for business while doing open source. But SciPy and NumPy came out of academic activities, right, for me. Like I was, an acad I was a professor when I wrote NumPy. I was a grad student when I wrote SciPy. And, um, and when I decided that the academic world wasn't where I was going to be able to want to continue to pursue this, like I, want, I cared about open source sustainability more than more than anything that became the thing that was driving me is kind of you often hear about your calling like find out what your calling in life should be and i felt like that was my calling that was the thing i needed to do for the world is is work in this space alongside with whoever else i could i could partner with and so mm -hmm. i left academia went to austin texas so i did academia in utah went to austin texas joined up with the with uh m thought that created um that helped me produce sci-pi uh and then we um you know, and did that for about four years and then met Peter Wang there. And along the way, you know, I, I said SciPy really was a distribution of Python. And then the thing that was happening in 2011 was the Hadoop, uh, the Hadoop craze was taking over and everyone was trying to scale data. And, and, you know, data processing is what I've been using Python for the whole time. It's like, well, this is, and, and everybody else knew that too. So lots of users were using Python, but there's a lot of conversation about this scaled world where suddenly Java was going to be the language everybody used for scaling for scaled computation. And that mm -hmm. was kind of the impression that was happening. It was in that environment that Peter and I said, well, we need to build a company that helps Python scale. Like that's, that helps NumPy scale and uh, pandas and, and then related at the same time was also this, you know, a, a bunch of companies were going, were adopting web UIs, you know, Microsoft had made a big investment. In fact, there's a little story here where I had a contract with, we had a contract with, with Microsoft to bring NumPy to .NET, right? So they were helping Ooh. us bring NumPy to .NET. Yeah, back in 19, 2008, 2000, no, it was 2010, I think, around that time frame. Now, the minute we signed that contract, the stakeholders on the Microsoft side all, were all redeployed to the JavaScript world. <laughs> so we signed the contract, but then kind of 
they lost interest, so to speak. They didn't lose interest. They wanted it still to us to make progress, but but we lost the juice, right? All of a sudden, they were they were making a bet on JavaScript, and that's what and that was not not it was a sensible bet. I mean, but it was a very clear intentional move on their part. That was and, and so that at that same time, I was saying, okay, we were doing a lot of UIs, you know, user interfaces, but on for desktop. Peter and I wanted to do scaled Python and user interfaces for web. So that became the impetus to create the new company. And so we created a new company, went out and got some funding, seed funding, and did a ton of stuff. Like <laughs> Peter and I are both, you know, you, you put us together and there's like, you know, it's not a surprise you got 15 projects emerge, right? It's you know, <laughs> sort of like, how do you manage this, 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 yeah. this sort of energy? But, but we were also leveraging the energy of that community. And I want to emphasize that because it's very true. Yes. Maybe we could have fit in a bus. There certainly was a time that everyone could fit in a, in a, in a Volkswagen, right? But <laughs> in a Beetle, in a lot, tiny little Beetle. By about 2009, 2010, it was a small conference. Like we'd have, we had regular about 70, 80 people who would come to SciPy every year. And, that, and that, we would have really good discussions there about arrays, about you know, how, to, how to compute. So it was in that ecosystem that Anaconda emerged. And Anaconda saw the potential for all of a sudden lots of money was flowing after data and they were all mm -hmm. saying the same thing they're all saying yes data will lead to you know machine learning you know, was there machine learning was a known thing scikit learn which was really is was a kind of a part of the sci-fi community they organized a new, a new library called scikit learn just so it wasn't distributed with sci-fi because it would have been too unwieldy to have everything in one package once you like it's really a much better idea to have a few like do one thing well rather than try to do yeah. everything at the same time and sure. then pull it and somebody has to pull it together, right? Somebody pulls that together, do one thing well. So scikit-learn emerged and they were um, being used and this community was using it and everyone was using that. So Anaconda came around, we actually call it Katina Analytics to begin with. And Katina Analytics, mm -hmm. it, we, we got into the distribution of Python really for the same reason that, that because that was still the problem. The problem was it's correct. You want to divide and do one thing well, but that requires integration. Like you as a user who's doing a thing, you having to gather from the four winds, all this divided expertise, like it, it requires integration. Like somebody has to provide integration. So the, the, the same reason in the world you have supermarkets and stores and online web pages and uh, like that needs to exist. And so Anaconda, we early on we're doing we're a technology company building a lot of open some open source and some consulting. We quickly kind of saw the potential to create this this distribution and this um, trusted binary business. And Anaconda's business is still mm -hmm. evolving, but it's basically kind of a, an ecosystem around helping people use this software well at scale. Yeah, so and there is as of today, software. as of today, we we. Uh, I think we see around like, I don't know, 40 million people knowing Python, 50 million, maybe yeah. it could be even yeah. greater. It's a good question. Today. How many it could be even, it could be even greater. Yeah. I think it's at least 40 million right now. Uh, Python users or Python adjacent people. Like you know, that's part of the challenge is who's a Python user. You know, it doesn't have to, it's not developers. Mm -hmm. It's not just developers. If you talk about people that are going no. to develop Python code, then it's a much smaller set. Maybe it's maybe it's only ten, maybe it's twelve. But mm -hmm. it's forty, I think, who are Python. Oh, I'm I'm a, I'm a scientist who uses Python. I'm a teacher who uses Python. I'm a business analyst who uses Python. I'm a data scientist yeah. who uses Python. This is the world that we live in, and that's where Anaconda came from. And the goal, the reason I cared and was willing to go through, because I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist pulled into the business world because yeah. of the desire to make open source sustainable, and effectively. When we did Anaconda, it was okay. Let's go, go, go get, go raise money to build a product that we can then have revenue coming back to the open source community. That was the that was the mission. That was the goal. That was one. That was the key. Now you know it's a, it's turns out building a company's hard. It's not. It's, you know, it's <laughs> yeah. sort of like step one, step two. Oh yeah, something happens here, and then money. Like oh, <laughs> something that happens here is actually a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so that, well, what was the uh, Travis? What was the power of uh, what was the place? Sorry, of uh, Jupyter notebooks in this? Like, can we talk oh, about that? Oh, fantastic question. Yes, yes. Now that's a very interesting story. So the very first notebook was actually Sage. Um, so the Cython story, and this is one of the 
awesome things about being a witness kind of to this whole events is that you have mm -hmm. all these great characters. You got Fernando Perez and you've got John Hunter and you've got Wes McKinney and you've got um, William Stein who created Sage and then and and Cython, which is this this compiler technology. Like all these are happening. It's about 2011, 2010, 2011. Uh, William Stein had shown us and, and we were gathered in, in Austin and, and William Stein was showing his notebook interface he'd written. Effectively, you know, and, and there had been previous interfaces that were like notebooks, Maple and Mathematica and other tools had these kind of interactive experiences. But he had written this in JavaScript and Fernando was there. It was like, and Fernando had previously written something called IPython, which is essentially the Python REPL on steroids, interactive Python, mm -hmm. a much better instead of just those three, those three little greater than signs, it was like, a, oh, I can, I can have magic methods and I can ask for things. It's kind of like a bash script. It's like my bash shell and my Python shell. Anyway, so IPython was very popular, but he wanted to put that experience in the web. And especially after seeing William's work, he wanted to do that. So roughly, you know, a few, maybe a year, within a year of seeing that demo, then, then the IPython notebook emerged. And IPython Notebook was kind of a combination between Fernando and Brian Granger with a lot of work from Min, Min, Ar, Min Rig and Kelly, Min RK. And he did a lot of work to create that. And I had a chance to kind of interact with them and try to help fund them and try to help, you know, get that going. But it was all them. They did, they did a ton of great work to make that happen. When it, and then, so, that, so roughly 2012 timeframe, they were emerging this. And they kind of wondered, would they, you know, they were both academics, Fernando and Brian, both Fernando still at yeah. Berkeley. Brian only recently went to Amazon about two years ago, maybe three at this point. Um, and he was an academic before then. And we ended up, uh, so I've been sort of a collaborator on, on the front of the Jupiter world. When, when Anaconda, we, we were able to get Bloomberg and provide a vehicle for Bloomberg to fund the community to build Jupiter Lab, and I was able to kind of work with the Jupiter Lab team directly. Like the, uh, uh, there's this early Jupiter Lab team that, that created this whole new stack and a lot of work. So it was pretty impressive to see that work. But Jupiter, Jupiter caught on pretty quickly. I would say that's one of the key things that was really interesting. You know, sometimes you do something. It's that, that old statement: do something and see how the world responds to you. And Jupiter notebooks were like that. Like they put this out there. And the world responded like people started, Hey, this is nice. I can use this. Yeah. It's helpful. It does. Uh, it's, it's giving me this, this sub, this, this cooperation plateau. I use that word sometimes. It's just, I, I'm, I'm saying, yeah. that, you know, abstractions that let people come together and share and think and communicate. It's like language, like things that help people communicate and share ideas and build on each other's ideas. Big deal. And that's what, that's what they kind of produce with Jupiter and notebooks. And then Fernando was always very attentive to the interface, con like building building the um, the protocol, the substrate. That because from his IPython kernel days, he'd understood the value of understanding the the separating the user experience from the kernel experience. And so when mm -hmm. Jupyter Notebooks came out, it was also separated into here's the user interface, here's the kernel and the cooperative communication path. So built standards there. The Jupyter ecosystem, you know, has taken off since and and multiple iterations since then. And there's others better able to talk about those iterations, but the origins I watched happen for the, for the very mm. first, you know, 10 years, um, quite, you know, pretty closely. Cool. And do you think that, uh, so as I see it, it's just my interpretation of the, of the story, but I, I see that, uh, notebooks were essentially brought by academics to do paper with mm. code, like repeatable, mm papers that you can test and this came at the other spectrum there was like the hardcore uh, software developers which were more in IDEs and developing stuff in Python and now that I kind of see that the, there is there's kind of this idea on okay the notebooks can be used for uh, interactive computing but they can be used for more um, for like deploying and, and distributing analysis to other people. And then there's always this like, uh, that, like a discussion around should notebooks should be, could be used in production, not used in production. What's the yeah. idea? I'm just bringing some ideas here because I think that it's not so much about the tool itself. It's about how you write your code. And I want to introduce this idea yeah. also of literate programming and how important it is to write good code and, and maybe we can deep dive into 
AI and generative AI and all this tech sure. debt that we are going to accumulate by just getting the code from generative AI. How does that? Oh, yeah. What do you thought? What do you think about it? <laughs> oh yeah, there's well, there's a lot of topics there that are going to be they're awesome to talk about. I think you you mentioned like one of the one of the challenges of notebooks. You said academics use it to write papers. That's true. The other thing they do with it is exploratory, uh, exploratory computing. I, I, there's this idea of like, and it's an important idea. One of the powers of Python is you can you can translate thought to code more quickly. And, and part of how yeah. you do that, and we, I recommend this all the time to student to people. Look, get the data in front of you. Get 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 access to parts of it. Start looking at it. Start manipulating it. Start like you debug your algorithm as you build it because you know you you know it's working. You sort of test your your testing while you build it. There's a way to kind of especially if you don't know quite what to do yet. You're dealing with kind of, you have the concepts in your head, but you need to kind of record, go back and forth. Notebooks were great for that for people because they could see snippets of code, they could see the output, they could, they could trace back. The challenge is that exploratory programming does need to eventually lead to a, a code that's, that's fixed, right? That one of the challenges with notebooks has been, okay, how do I go from this exploratory programming, exploratory framing to uh, execution framing to now I'm going to repeat this yeah. over and over again. Like, yeah. and that's where to logic dates, so been. to speak, like to, uh, to, well, yeah. to a logical flow, right? Where it's not because one of the yeah. challenges is you get a you get a notebook and you've got the input and the output. You don't really know if the out like because you can have out of flow execution. Like the output mm -hmm. you see could have happened because you executed the whole notebook then this cell three times and this cell two times. And then yeah. again, and that led to the output. So there's this, and that's that's exactly why at NAS we are making it input model output on the templates we do, and we do like this needs to yeah. be executed all the way to. That's that's our yeah, opinionated way of saying you put like constraints on it. Yes, you put constraints yes. on it. What I love about NAS is you put constraints on it, and then you allow a place for hey, I can do my exploratory programming, but then I have a target to move it to a constrained notebook. And that's yeah. that may be simpler than refactoring to library code that then, um, you know, especially in this problem of going to literate programming, which really translates to optimizing the same thing I was doing as a student, as a scientist, was a student scientist, was basically I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do my thing, not figure out how to, <laughs> how to deal with regular expressions, right? I mean, there's the old saying yeah. with regular expressions is, okay, now you've got regular expressions, you have, you have a problem, you decide to use regular expressions, now you have two problems. Right, you have to figure out what <laughs> expressions mean and how they work. Right, it's, it's kind of that's a that's a that's a humorous way to describe a fundamental problem, which is I have my problem to think about, and then any time I bring a tool in, that tool can either you know it's either incrementally I get to help that problem, or it's like dramatically different thinking I have to think about, and you know how do you get it so I can keep in my headspace the problem I care about and enough computing power that it fits into my the problem I'm thinking about. So notebooks, I think, are an interesting entry into that into that challenge. If I'm thinking about my problem, notebooks give me a chance to stay thinking about my problem, but then start to introduce, you know, patterns that'll help me. What you what NAS provides is this easy way to hey, here's your template, here's the here's a type, here's a kind of way to organize your notebook that you can then use as a component in a workflow reliably mm -hmm. and now that now yeah. you can put into production so you basically yes. i've had this concept in my head i've used sometimes called a operational notebook like an operational exactly. notebook is basically the things you have to do to harden a, a, a workflow expression to make it production ready under you know code yeah. is just you know, code is not like and, and some of the generative ai i think will amplify is code is not for the elites only like you know anybody you know all of a sudden today Generative AI, you can generate lots of code. Like generative AI, yes. LLMs can produce code. Now, now, okay, now how you know? There's a lot of risk that's going to produce a lot of code that nobody's going to maintain, right? Which mm -hmm. is, you know, and, and maybe people go, well, that's okay. I'll just throw it away and use new code I create from the, from the generative AI. And mm -hmm. I okay. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> that there would be. I mean, you know, for business my, my, usage, I don't know if this will be. Yeah. Uh, so my, my, a way my, to... my current view actually, my current view is I think what will work is it'll actually increase the dependency and the need for solid frameworks. 
for solid abstractions, for solid things. Because what I think Generative AI can do is attentive, essentially write the APIs to the framework. But it means that mm -hmm. that has to exist and they have to be good and they have to be well thought through. I don't think the Generative AI will be, it will be writing the frameworks. It might help people writing the frameworks to organize their thoughts. That's a separate, that's a, that's a separate thing. But generally, that's yeah. what I like Generative AI for. It's almost like, it's almost like someone to help you organize your thoughts. It's like a personal assistant yes. to help you organize your thoughts. Cool. Yes. Like, and, and you, you, and so you can make, I think it can help us be more productive, but it can't, but we'll need more and better frameworks and tools and, and plateaus of cooperation, places to actually shared abstractions. I've used that term before too. Like NumPy essentially yes. is a shared abstraction and very powerful because it was, it knows that that's what it's trying to be. And it's not trying to be more, it's just trying to be a place of cooperation. Anyway, that's, um, that's an important, I think for generative AI, yes, I, w I wouldn't shy away from it. Like I, I tell all yeah. my developers, yeah. all my marketing people to use it, use it, but, but recognize, well, what I've told them is like, you cannot, you cannot blame ChatGPT or generative AI for your code. Like if you check something in, it's still your code. Right. It's not, I see. You, know, you can't, the, the, the computer didn't make you do it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Help you. You need to take it. <laughs> At least it's great agency agency to, okay. I now yeah. I have this generation of code. I am now the, the guy that is in charge yeah. of making all this thing together and, and maybe yeah. open my eyes a bit more to the business problem that I'm trying to solve. Yeah. I see generative yeah. guy as really yeah. a, a way to, Okay, now that I don't have this burden of finding out the code, going to Stack Overflow, copy pasting yeah. different things, I can just take this and now yeah. spend more time into actually the meaning of what I'm doing and how we how yes. people will use it, and that's that's very powerful in a way. I completely but agree. But it's it's that's good. Wise. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good thing. Also, I think uh, we 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 wish to see in the future is more people using generative AI to 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 expose more work to people, like to expand the number of people knowing about Python, about knowing about what you can do with right. this language and how you can achieve right. things more efficiently. There's so many problems to solve in the world anyway. So it's, yeah. it's interesting when I was a, when I was a medical imaging student, there were, there were people, literally people worried that computers can replace doctors even then. Right. And I, and I, it was very yeah, clear to me that I, I was don't not believe it. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's still not going to happen. And, and the reason, yeah, is, still. like I was like, I, well, the reason is because, you know, it's not about the tool doing the work. It's about, there's a relationship there. There's a thing that has to happen. Somebody, and then somebody has to be accountable for that. Right. Somebody's there's, there's, yeah. I'm deciding to do this. Yes. The computers will change what people do every day. They can absolutely change the day to day of a, of a, of, a, of the professional. They can change the data of a developer. Like, but, but I think that could change like a day to day of a developer, a modern, a lot of developers day do spend time on stack overflow. Like back in the day, I spent time putting stuff that, you know, questions into Google. So I could get, you know, I just ask, like, here's my error message, Google point me to some web page somewhere that there was a moment in time when that was actually useful. It's less useful today because there's a lot more, <laughs> there's a lot more content marketing on the web that is, mm -hmm. is kind of fluffy. <laughs> yeah. There's less kind True. of raw core detail there. So my, my hope though, is these tools can be used to augment the practitioner and then help us actually make meaningful contributions. So I, you know, I have two, if, if your goal is to just get rich quick with generative AI, that's going to, you know, maybe that will work for a couple of people. That's, that's a sort of a path to failure long-term for society. Or if you're, or if your fear is that generative AI, that AI is going to somehow replace everybody, then I think you're also not um, looking at the, the we, we have the wrong relationship structures we have the wrong governance structures the wrong the wrong you know who decides what you do every day i'm hopeful that generative ai can make us all more prosperous so we have time for more meaningful interactions with each other things that matter and I, there are you know definitely going to be some disruptions to all kinds of things i, I yeah. believe that i do believe it will they will create disruptions in a lot of pattern and a lot of things we're used to but what we need a lot of is we need thoughtful curious passionate caring people, compassionate people who are essentially as many of them as possible using these tools to, to serve each other, to serve one another, to help each other, to work, to build things that others can use, to help people have their, you know, have, have more in their life. That's, and I think that's, you know, that, that's the community of people that I've been able to cooperate with over the past 30 years, 28 years. And I, and that's, there's, that's still community is going to be there if we just keep 
if we, you know, keep trusting it and relying on each other. So that bus of people, you know, and, and, and that's been true no matter how big the bus has gotten. Like I was just in mm -hmm. Lithuania meeting, you know, hundreds of new friends in Lithuania, never been there before, never didn't know these people, but saw similar people. You know, I've been in, and I haven't been yet to many countries, but I've been on the phone with other people in other countries. And you see the same thing in Africa. You see the same thing in South America. You see the same thing. Yeah, in, that's uh, really massive Asia. what's going on. And so there's, there's much, much more power there in the human cooperation. And to me, generative AI can help unleash potential because it can help education. It can help you rapidly come up to speed with things that might take you instead of several months, you can kick in several weeks, you can understand. I've already watched that happen with my children. I've watched that happen with myself, trying to learn a new area with the, the, the help of a, of, a, of a conversational tutor, basically. The thing you mm -hmm. can't do is just assume that, oh, you know, here's my Oracle and I just follow whatever it says. Like, no, you no, have to kind yeah. of, it, you know that it's it's interpolating information and it may be wrong. Yeah. Right. But it's, critical it's, thinking it's maybe open, is the key. It has a lot of knowledge. Critical thinking is the key. Let's bring that back. <laughs> let's keep encouraging. Yeah, let's, let's come up with a different word besides critical thinking. Let's call it like I would rather call it something like uh, you know compassionate thinking maybe or or or, or <laughs> practical thinking. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I like critical thinking part. because in a way it, it brings the provocative tone of you shouldn't trust what you see first. That's yeah, fair. I like this. That's also. fair. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, cool, yeah, Charles. That's, that, that's, that's really cool to, to have a conversation with you on this because you've been, you've been seeing everything happen from the very beginning and now you have reached that moment in time that generative AI well, is I, now I, very popular and... Uh, yeah, I what, what I was I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Your your your, your question. No, no. I was wondering about uh, your your options uh, today on, um, yeah. you know, what what you see on the people and how the people can bring value to companies. How you connect co uh, open source community to companies. I know that you've built open teams and and we we've seen that happening. As I didn't realize it at first. But I saw, I see now that it's a, a, a bit of a, an aggregator of talents, so that the companies can source open source professional yes. more easily. So, yes. what's next for that? Like, how does this bus of people become actually a worldwide, without any like, uh, um, I would say, any physical entity? You can bring all those people together to connect to different companies. I think it's a very big challenge that you are into. It, uh, can you? Can challenge. you? Can you probably? Yeah, I would say. Tell us about I that. I, yeah, I don't pretend that that anything we're doing is is going to solve all of it, right? I believe we, we've got a really uh, uh, what we're trying to do is shore up and help where key opportunities arise, and then inspire people to create. So, you know, Quansight was a recreation. So, you know, when I, when I mentioned Anaconda uh, yeah. in 2018, I started Quansight effectively to recreate the foundations of Anaconda. Because Anaconda gave rise from a very particular kind of engagement and interaction, but do it in a way that mm. we could learn from the past and then learn how to scale from to more than just one company. Like the goal at Quonset was not to create a single, you know, big company again. It was actually create energy to create and to help multiple companies thrive. So um, we and we finally did that with Open Teams, and Open Teams has three, you know, three three facets, right? Three divisions, three three energies, basically. Tried to do it with one, mm -hmm. but realized that these are actually three separate. Uh, uh, you know, three separate motions, so, three mm. separate motions. Exactly. The, and so open teams has three separate motions. There's the one motion that's really about collecting the world's technical experts into a community of what we call open source architects. And then that community, nurturing that community, a few of those people, maybe 5%, maybe 1% might want to become what we call partners and partners can do fulfillment with They're interested in actually working. The other community members, not, they won't necessarily be a project they won't be a contractor on a project. They'll just talk. They'll talk about how to build better software with open source. They'll talk about the constraints, the challenges, the issues. They might have products like you have people at NAS that will be very good OSAs who understand what it takes to do to build enterprise software with open source. But effectively, they're in, they're showing people how to use NAS to do it. So they're your company helping people show show how to use NAS to do it. 
but then they might partner with somebody else who's going to implement it for a company and be a service organization. So Open Teams is that network, and then we also provide a a, a way for companies to pay for it and not have to contract with hundreds of different service professionals. So if you're a person and you say, I'm going to use open source in my company, you might have 100 open source projects. Are you going to find you know, 15 open source consultancies who have the experts to help you? So Open Teams is the single company you can go to, provide the procurement mechanism, and then we have what, what we call it project success. It's a customer success program to ensure it's a common way to make sure you're getting what you want. And, and it's a light touch. It's just technical program management. And then we connect with the world's experts. So we're basically this superstore to connect with the world's experts, and we work with them to give you access to anybody you need. But you don't have to go search the world for those people. Any company can come to Open Teams to build better software and open source. Now, that's the, Open Teams focuses on the technical leadership, right? And the technical leadership ultimately has their team. Like they're responsible to go build their team and get the people they're going to use to help them. So. We, we have other mechanisms to help those people. And that's, so that's, that's Open Teams. Um, Open Teams Global is an HR and recruiting company. So it's sort of a separate engagement that the technical lead can work with if they want help recruiting and employing. So it's, it's a, there's an old problem. I've been doing consulting for a lot for about 15 years now. And the problem exists of open source is a global phenomena, but employment is a local, uh, a local uh, compliance problem. You have local compliance. But, but open team, but open source is a, is a, is a global uh, conversation. So open teams global's whole mission is to connect people to open source opportunities in the countries they live in. So they can actually have an employment in the countries they live in, but work for the, 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 the growth of open source projects and companies using open source, what I call open source aligned businesses. Mm. That's open teams global. Uh, and then cool. open teams, then the final, the final one, I don't talk about it that often, but with you, I'll talk about it, Jeremy, because we're working together in this facet. It's Open Teams Incubator. And Incubator is, that's where I'm going to be working forever. Like, I'm hoping to get global and Open Teams off the ground with other CEOs running those companies so they can exist and help the world. And then I'm going to be running, running, working with Incubator because it does kind of where my heart is, helping companies, helping early stage companies emerge and, and, and get built and grow. So we... Open Teams Incubator basically provides help to early stage companies, both funding as well as uh, resource help, whether it's part-time marketing, part-time CTO, part-time CFO, you know, just all the stuff. After building Anaconda, man, I wish I'd had somebody to help me. <laughs> there are so many things I wish I would have, I would have been able to learn yeah. and realize, oh my gosh, there's so many, so many traps I fell into that, that it didn't, ex you know, I, I just needed a mentor, needed somebody to help. So Incubator is there to provide mentorship. Not just with me. I mean, I'm happy to help, but I'm also connecting people with other mentors that are out there. So create this this mechanism for really helping early stage companies. It's mission driven. You know, obviously, we'll we hope to invest in some winners, but long term, we're just really mission driven about supporting uh, supporting open source aligned entrepreneurship and open source aligned businesses. We don't have time today, but I'll just you know, one of the companies we're incubating an incubator is something called Fair OSS, F A I R O S S dot org. That mm -hmm. is my big, hairy, audacious goal. It's currently my, my, my dream company. It's the thing I, and it's more of an organization, but it's, it's an idea. I think if we could put, make it, bring it to fruition, it would completely solve the open source sustainability problem and actually create new problems probably, but it would, it would make anybody in the world able to participate with open source. And when they create something meaningful, they would then be able to sustain their, their creation of that. Because ultimately what I'm trying to fix is the problem of, yeah, we did something amazing with NumPy and SciPy. We did. You know, me and a thousand of my closest friends, right, I sometimes say. You know, it's not really a thousand. It's more like maybe a hundred. But, there, but it was a group of people that did this together that deserve lots of credit. And, uh, but yet we weren't able to get enough money to sustain it, you know, until recently. Like recently I would say we finally are – you know, up until up five years ago, I was saying there's nobody working on Sci NumPy full time. Nobody working on SciPy full time. Now I can say yes, there are about three, four, two people working on these full time. But so it's a start. But I'm like, how do yeah. we, how do we get it? So these are core tools. Why weren't there ten people working on it full time? Why couldn't we make create the situation so that so that NumPy could evolve and could add GPU support, could add automatic differentiation? could add the key things that were necessary for generative, for AI to evolve. And so, you know, 
Meta, nor Meta, nor Google have to spend, uh, I, I don't know exactly how much they've spent, but I definitely guarantee it's north of tens of millions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, they didn't have to spend, probably $100 million each is my guess. They didn't have to spend $100 million each to essentially build from, I mean, they're doing more than the NumPy is doing, to be clear, right? What they're doing is more than that, but there's no reason what they're doing couldn't be just built on the NumPy base, on the NumPy core. Exactly. So that's, I think that's a, that's a good uh, way to probably close this conversation is this really big idea on there should be more money flowing to open source yeah. because it's eventually the foundation of the next 10, 20 years. It already yes. has been foundational for the, 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 the pre-AI era, but it's yes. even more important in the future. And uh, I think what you're building is amazing, Travis. And I want to say that without connecting with you, if, if we, we wouldn't have connected with you, we would have feel alone like we were, we were feeling alone before in in this thing that we were yeah. trying to build around you know notebooks and templates and how to stitch templates together you know operational notebooks so that you can build tools with it it has been an idea in our head and 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 with many people that we have encountered that come from the business world and not from the scientific yes. world where you come from and i guess that those two worlds are going to um, to merge even more now that there is this generative ai systems that are in place yes. it's even more obvious that the scientific uh, era, I would say the entire scientific wave of using Python and everything, now will go a little bit down and this business oriented and organization serving people era is not is something that is now on the rise and we need even more, uh, you know, organization and system like what you're doing. I think that's what I see. I mean, I, the, the, I think it's the end of the wave. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing what you're trying to do here. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that this is a very, very good bet in the fu on, on the future. Uh, and I, I would, I, so what, I, what, I agree what, with you, Jeremy. what people I should do if they want to, well to join your, your, your ecosystem, like they, anyone can, <laughs> can, can, yeah. can join the can open teams you. global. So, so anybody can join what we call OSPN.org. It's the open source professional network and it's sponsored by Open Teams and Open Teams Global. So okay. it's free to join. And the idea there is just to build a profile, build a network and have connections to people that are looking for to help you in your open source career. So OSPN.org, anybody can join. And it's meant to kind of nurture your career and your contributions to open source. Uh, then so if you have experience, if you've got you know two, seven years of experience with open source, two years of technical leadership experience, so you don't have to be super experienced, you don't have to have a little bit, then you know, apply to join our OSA community, our open source architect community. And that's, you can reach out uh, really simply, uh, go to openteams.com and there's a button to click to join the network and apply. There'll be you know, new ways to, 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 you can also reach out to me personally if you want. I currently manage the open source architect network. So reach out to me mm -hmm. personally at travis at openteams.com or Twitter at T.E. Oliphant, happy to DM me on Twitter. I guess you'd have, I, I think, however that works, you can be, reach me there or on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn at T.E. Oliphant. Uh, Travis at openteams.com is probably the easiest way and the best way, um, but mm -hmm. happy, to, happy to get in touch. And if you have any interest in any of it, Travis at openteams.com, happy to talk with you. Uh, anywhere from Quonsite to Open Teams to Global to Ferro Assess to Incubator. Like I said, I am trying to, you know, I'm, I'm, my life work at this point is to spend as much time as I can, you know, to, to, to pass on information I understand. I do like to work on technical problems, uh, mostly applied math problems still, mostly on the, you know, compiler levels. I mean, I'd love to see Numba. There's things I want to do there to help Numba kind of merge into, um, uh, you know, literate programming, make people able to build things. I don't get a chance to do that as much anymore, but that's why I'm still interested in helping that emerge. <laughs> Still help in that. So I have interest technically. A lot of time I spend is on essentially connecting people with money to opportunities with in open source and in business around open source. So eager to help, uh, eager to, to share whatever knowledge I have with people that'll help. And uh, grateful for the chance to talk to you, Jeremy, in this podcast. And it's been an amazing conversation. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, an amazing conversation we just got. I really feel fulfilled by this conversation and even more motivated to spend my energy on open source. So thank you, Travis. Great. Have a good one. And um, let's uh, catch up soon. See you. I will. Thank you, Jeremy. You have a great day. Bye.
Bye. See you.